Justin Timberlake proved that he really was bringing sexy back when he was crowned the King of Sex by Rolling Stone magazine in 2007, beating George Clooney and Brad Pitt to the title. At the age of 26, the former busboy was sitting on top of the world, having sold more than 60 million albums worldwide and with six Grammy Awards and two Emmys to his name. He'd come a long way from Memphis, Tennessee, where he grew up singing country music songs as plain old Justin Randall. His bid for fame began on the TV talent show Star Search, and at the age of 13, he donned the big ears and hit the big time in the new Mickey Mouse Club. As well as opening the door to teenage romance with fellow Mouseketeer Britney Spears, the show also introduced him to his future bandmate, J.C. Chassez. After a seven-year run with NSYNC, which yielded millions of sales and a host of Grammy nominations, J.T. struck out on his own with his first solo album, Justified. Nominated for a host of MTV Europe Awards in 2003, he didn't have high hopes of the night. I don't know, man. I'll, I'll be satisfied with anything. I'll be satisfied with it. You, I, I'll take best ass in a video, and it doesn't, e it doesn't even have to be mine. Just maybe like an extra in my video, and I'll take it. But he ended up going home with three awards and went on to win two more at the Grammys for Best Pop Vocal Album and Best Pop Vocal Performance. The award-winning video to his single Rock Your Body also cemented his reputation as one of the best dancers in the industry. A year later, he teamed up with former Mickey Mouse colleague Christina Aguilera to take to the road. We're both in, in, in new places in our career, right. uh, even though this is my first solo album and, and it's her second. Kind of reintroducing uh, both of our yeah. ourselves as artists. We just thought, why not? Their combined Justified and Strip tour took the two 22-year-olds on 45 dates across North America. I'll be performing Justin's. Yeah, and I'll be performing Christina's, so. And it'll be fun. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no of course. Um, yeah, I mean, of course our own stuff. I'll be reinventing some of my old stuff into, you know, where I'm at musically today with uh, this album and, and um, have some sing-along action. And uh, there's something definitely for everybody as well as giving Justin the opportunity to expand his live performance skills, the grueling tour was a great test of his physical fitness. It's really about stamina, you yeah. know, and, and making sure you get enough rest to, to keep this going for three months because it's a grind. It really is a grind. You're, you're on a bus every night. You're, you're, you're traveling, you know, every day. And if you're not doing that, then you're on stage, you know, uh, basically getting the cardio workout of your life. Another of Justin's on-stage collaborations proved to be just as grueling, if for very different reasons. In 2004, his duet with Janet Jackson during halftime at the Super Bowl treated 140 million viewers to the sight of Janet's breast, bared courtesy of a well-timed rip by Justin. The fallout from the so-called wardrobe malfunction threatened to stall both of their careers and Justin dutifully apologized while accepting the first of his two Grammys at the 2004 awards. After that controversy, he put a hold on his recording career to concentrate on other pursuits like acting in films and launching his own fashion label. But two years later, he was back on song with Future Sex Love Sounds. I think that what we were trying to create was just something new and fresh. There's no it's sort of the opposite of Justified in how non-personal it is. I mean, Justified, it's fair to say that that was pretty autobiographical or inspired by what I was going through at the time. His second album presented a much more sophisticated and sultry side of Justin than Justified. I think it's important on your sophomore album to, to, to broaden your sound, to, to try something new, because if you do the same thing, then your third album has to be the same thing and your fourth album has to be the same thing and you don't, you don't grow, you know, and, um, and c quite honestly, like, if, if I'm not going to push it, then who's going to push it, you know, I, and, and that's, I don't, I say that in a humble way, you know, I say that in a very grounded way, I just think, like, that's the challenge that I like to put on myself. 
He shared the producing honours with the likes of Will I Am, Danger, and Rick Rubin, as well as his Justified collaborator Timberland. I knew I wanted to work with Timberland again, and I knew I wanted to work with him a lot more on this album because, personally, in, in, in my opinion, my favorite song off Justified is Cry Me a River. It's my favorite. So I, I remember calling Tim on the phone and asking him if he thought we could do five or six Cry Me a Rivers. And uh, so it's a lofty challenge, but you know, Timberland's the type of producer that when you call him and say that, it, it challenges him. He doesn't back down from that. And that's something that I knew I would get from it. For the album's lead single, Sexy Back, he found inspiration in the 70s and 80s sounds of Prince and David Bowie and searched for a more rocky edge to his voice. I remember, I remember thinking so bad that I wanted to be an R&B artist on the first album and then everybody kept calling me a pop artist. So I think somewhere in, in the last two years I sort of accepted that and decided that, well, then I don't just do R&B then. And, and it actually helped me, it inspired me even more once I sort of became humble to that. But more than bringing sexy back, what he really wanted to do was make people dance. Creating something that, like you said, people will play in their cars or clean their house to or have a house party to or make love to or, you know, when it comes on in, in, a, in a nightclub, you know, they, they want to jump on top of a table and dance. That's what I'm more inspired by. I don't feel like I'm actually bringing sexy back. I don't know if sexy actually left us. After Justin performed it at the 2006 MTV Music Awards, Sexy Back shot straight to the top of the Billboard charts and stayed there for seven consecutive weeks. The album's second and third singles also topped the charts, confirming JT as the top pop act of the year, which helped set him up for a collaboration with the undisputed queen of pop herself. Clearly comfortable swapping creative juices with a wide range of collaborators, Justin jumped at the chance to work with Madonna on her 2008 retro styled release, Hard Candy. Their songwriting teamwork spawned five songs on the album, including the duet, Four Minutes. Four Minutes became the album's lead single. It topped the charts in the UK and went top five in the US. It certainly wasn't the first time that Justin had contributed his talents to other artists' work. Back in 2007, he and Timberland had teamed up to work their magic on a 50 Cent song called AO Technology. More recently, he's worked with 80s new romantics Duran Duran and saucy R&B singer Sierra. Working with Justin was a lot of fun, you know. Um, he's a very, very passionate person about his music and he just has a really great personality and he's very down to earth, you know. Um, so it's like so many great things to say about him. Um, and doing the actual video was like one of the best video experiences that I've had thus far, you know, out of shooting all the videos that I've done. It was just really easy going and we had a lot of fun. The video to her single, Love Sex Magic, involves some serious tongue action and evoked the obvious question, what's it like licking Justin Timberlake? Yeah, that's so funny. It's so funny when people ask me that, I'm like, it's weird, I don't know why it feels weird, you know? Um, but we just went for it, you know? It was just all about trying to give you a little something, something fun, you know? Um, and he also licked me a little bit too, so I have to say it was, it was just really fun though. Just, you know, all about having a good time and just bringing the record to life as much as possible, you know? He's even reversed roles with Timberland, signing on as producer on Timberland's solo effort, Shock Value. When I heard about everybody that was going to be, you know, featured or contributing to the record was the first thing I thought of was Quincy Jones, you know, back on the block. And to me, that's, that's what Tim is. He's a modern day Quincy Jones to me. Having just an input, he was already still hype from the Future Sex Love, and I feel like he didn't get a lot out because only 12 songs. Yeah. So he had more to get out, but we know how to cut it short. So I said, but I said, you might as well come in and be like a producer with me on this album and 
give your input, and I'll just take it from there. Since then, Justin has also co-written and performed on the third single from Timberland's follow-up album, Shock Value 2. In between his many musical endeavors, Justin has found the time and energy to devote to a bewildering array of other interests. Along with his childhood friend Trey Sayala, he's also been bringing sexy back to the world of male fashion, with their own label, William Rast. Starring cord jackets, cashmere sweaters, jeans and polo shirts, the label takes its inspiration from another Memphis-born star, Elvis Presley. The label's name takes its inspiration from even closer to home. William is the first name of Justin's grandfather, and Rast is the last name of Trace's. In 2007, Justin and Trace launched their spring collection in LA, with the support of some very influential friends, including Justin's ex, Cameron Diaz. This is something that comes so natural to them because Trace is such a fashion maven, like he really is. He loves fashion and, and um, you know, he's always been a part of that. It's kind of a connection the two of them have is clothing. So it's been really fun to watch them do this together because they really are, you know, connected in that way and they've made, you know, a great line. I'm really happy for them. Musicians are just naturally, innately creative people. So I think anything they want to use to sort of channel their creative vision, I think, is generally a successful thing. And I think Justin's great at everything he does. I mean, have we ever seen him not good at something? So, I mean, I would imagine it's going to be a great show. I'm excited. Another of the label's partners praised Justin's commitment to the enterprise. J Justin is 100% involved. He, um, from buttons to rivets to choosing the denim washes, he's very involved and very meticulous. He's, he's a great, great partner to have. Proving that his interest in fashion wasn't just a fad, Justin was in Berlin two years later to launch the 2009 Autumn Collection. William Rast is now being sold at Bloomingdale's, Saks Fifth Avenue, Nordstrom and high-end boutiques such as Fred Seagal and Atrium. Justin also owns three restaurants, one in West Hollywood and two in New York. At the launch of Southern Hospitality, he was proud to be serving up his grandmother's finger-licking recipes to the Big Apple. Um, well, they're all good. Her pecan pie is pretty, pretty signature. Yeah. So I recommend that right out of the oven with some, you know, vanilla bean ice cream. In his downtime, he loves nothing better than to play a round of golf. But when you're just in Timberlake, even a hobby needs to be taken very seriously. After buying a rundown golf course in his hometown, he reportedly invested $16 million into making it more environmentally friendly. There's no doubting Justin's talent for making money. In 2007, he came in as one of the world's richest entertainers under 30. Thankfully, however, he also has a knack for giving back. He first got involved with charitable causes back in the late 90s through NSYNC's Challenge for the Children. And in 2001, he set up his own foundation to fund music education programs in schools. I grew up in a small town, Millington, Tennessee. And um, in my school, there really was no music. There, there, there wasn't a, a music program. And um, I kind of thought about that. You know, and, and, and I thought about the fact that, three, about three or four years ago, I thought about the fact that if I wouldn't have urged my mom to, you know, take me to voice lessons privately and, um, you know, to, you know, buy me a guitar and, and you know, um, you know, get a piano, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have learned music. It probably, you know, it may have, it may have changed the path that I went down, you know, um, especially when you're at a young age, anything that occurs can totally change. A path, um, so I, uh, I kind of thought to myself, what better way to, to, to you know, to get involved with the foundation and something that I believe in. The foundation has since expanded to embrace a broader agenda, and in 2005, Justin was presented with an award by the Grammy Association for his humanitarian work. 
He has also been very generous with his time, regularly dropping in to visit children in hospital while on tours around the world. Before a gig in London in 2003, he surprised patients at a special lodging house for seriously ill children in Earl's Court. It was just so amazing and he, he was just so friendly and outgoing and, and he got a, all of us a present for Christmas. And what did he buy you? He, he gave us all a t-shirt, poster and his, new, and his new album and I just thought that was so sweet of him. For one young patient, the excitement was perhaps a little too much. Excited, weren't you, yeah. this morning? Yeah, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't concentrate at school, really, because I was thinking, oh, who am I going to meet, who am I going to meet? Maybe it's Justin Timberlake, oh, I'm going to scream if I see you, I'm going to faint. I don't know what I was going to do. <laughs> It's not just children that he supports. In 2007, Justin donated $100,000 from his Australian tour to the Wildlife Warriors, a conservation charity set up by the late Steve Irwin. The following year, he handed over the same amount to two music organizations in Memphis. That sense of social responsibility extends to the political arena. Joining the campaign to encourage and empower young Americans to vote in the 2008 US elections, he spoke of the importance of engaging with society and taking part in the political process. I wasn't long ago when I was 18 and, and you're, you're searching to find your voice. You know, at that age you're, searching to, uh, you're, you're entering adulthood and searching to find your voice and, and uh, there's no better way to, uh, at lack of a better term, declare your voice than, than to vote. I mean, you are officially an adult, so you, you know, it's not a responsibility, it's actually a privilege to get to decide, you know, who runs our country. He used his influence with the country's youth to get the message across. I did an absentee ballot the last election and, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, what empowers you, as, as like I said before, I think, I think, uh, you know, you choose you choose not to vote, you choose not to have a voice. So, um, you know, like I said before, you're, you're an adult now and, and, um, and you have a voice. You've wanted it your whole 17 years and you're 18 now and you have it. And this goes for 18, 19 and 20, college kids, you know, I mean, this is your opportunity to really put your stamp on history, really. And uh, so, so I don't know what's more empowering than that. And he made no secret of the way he would be voting come the elections. For him, it was Barack Obama all the way. I like his spirit. I like his, uh, I like his, uh, I like his confidence. I like his ability to communicate. I've met the man and he looked me straight in the eye like I was, like I was a man. Um, and I like his uh, I like his take on on getting young people involved, my demographic involved with the country. Despite his household name status, Justin has always shown determination to keep his private life private. No, how much I've I've been in the press, I kind of choose to not read it and keep it whatever it is, whatever it is. But ignoring the press has been no mean feat for a megastar who's had more than his fair share of megastar partners. Back in 1999, the paparazzi caught the whiff of a romance between Justin and his former Mickey Mouse Club colleague Britney Spears. Despite their best efforts to play down the relationship, the press wouldn't let go. And when rumours emerged that Britney may have done the dirty with choreographer Wade Robson, they were relentless in their pursuit of a scoop. However, within the year, Justin had started dating Charlie's Angel star Cameron Diaz, after meeting her at the Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards. If Justin wanted to keep his private life private, he wasn't making things easy for himself. At the time, Cameron was the highest paid actress in Hollywood, commanding as much as $20 million per movie. Still, they did manage to preserve some privacy by rarely appearing in public together 
and being quick to hit back at gossip about the relationship. In 2004, Justin sued the News of the World for alleging he cheated on Cameron with a British model. He won the case and the tabloid apologised for the distress and embarrassment caused by the article and accepted that the allegations were without foundation. During their three-year love affair, they both refused to respond to questions. You've got a wedding uh, a ring on your finger there. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Ironically, it wasn't until the relationship was all over that the pair began appearing side by side, treading the green carpet together at premieres of Shrek 3, the animated feature to which they'd both lent their voices. As they waved and smiled, Justin seemed happy to joke around with reporters, who seemed a little confused by the situation. Sorry about that. Uh, a, pr a pretty lady, a pretty lady pokes you and wants to hug you. I'm sorry, you just you walk away. Cameron, on the other hand, seemed a little more edgy. Um, he's right there. I mean, there's no blows being thrown, is there? <laughs> it's only difficult when people ask about it because then you go, why are they asking about it? In Berlin, she didn't take too kindly to journalists asking if working together as exes had felt strange. It's not strange, we're very good friends. It's, I, I think it's really funny when people ask that question because it says more about them than anything, really. By that time, Justin had already been rumoured to have enjoyed a brief romantic interlude with Scarlett Johansson before starting up a much more serious relationship with starlet Jessica Biel who'd just been named the sexiest woman alive by Esquire magazine. She'd also been steaming up the screen with Ed Norton in love scenes for the period thriller The Illusionist. They're perfect for the film. They're very sophisticated and classy and very artsy. And that's my favorite type of love scene anyway. When you really don't see anything but you see something. You know what I mean? You think you see something but you don't. That's the most intriguing type of love scene. Together, she and Justin made an incredibly hot couple, except that neither of them would confirm that they actually were together. Photos of them getting cozy found their way into gossip magazines in mid-2007. But a year later, in answer to Jay Leno's questions about rumors they were engaged and that Jessica was pregnant, Justin refused to comment. In early 2010, the relationship that many gossip columnists had tipped to make it to the altar was all over, with some suggesting that Justin could be rekindling his romance with Cameron on the set of a new romantic comedy called Bad Teacher. But any journalist hoping for a quote from Justin on the state of their relationship is bound to be sorely disappointed. Mm -hmm.